So it's my pleasure to be here. Um, you want to already introduce the, the title and subject of my talk. I'm from Johns Hopkins University. I'd like to, before I get started, give special thanks to Blake Dewey, Leon Rejuo, and Aaron Karras, two students and a, and a colleague who were very uh, instrumental in doing all of this work and in helping me prepare these slides. So first I'd like to start with an introduction to harmonization. We're all familiar with this problem in MRI that uh, there's lack of standardization of the intensity scale. This is an example on T1 weighted images from different scanners. It's all recognizable as T1, but there's subtle differences in the contrast. Same thing applies in other contrasts, T2 and flare, for example. This causes trouble in post-processing where we're going to get differences in the outcome, inconsistent volumetrics if we're doing segmentation and sometimes even outright algorithm failure. Harmonization is the process of adjusting these image intensities to compensate for variations in this acquisition. There's been a lot of work on this, sometimes in different guises, but often can be used for harmonization and it's been tried out for harmonization going way, way back, which I won't be describing each of these, all the way up until modern times with machine learning methods and our disentangled latent space method, which I'm gonna talk about. Before getting started, I'd like to distinguish harmonization from domain adaptation, which I think of as different. Domain adaptation is trying to take the task and adjust the task so it can apply to different domains. Sometimes it may use harmonization, but fundamentally harmonization is simply adjusting the images so that a given algorithm uh, can work. The scenarios where you might use harmonization um, involve perhaps this scenario where you have a single site and you've got a new scanner. You have an algorithm that you've designed for the old scanner and you want to use the data from the new scanner. In this case, you might be able to use overlapping subjects where you've scanned them on both scanners and then you can use supervised harmonization in fairly straightforward uh, deep network uh, training application. A more difficult scenario is when you have multiple scanners, your algorithms on one site, and you would like to harmonize data or be able to use the algorithm from other sites. But in general, you may not have overlapping subjects, in this case, traveling subjects. And so you have to resort to unsupervised harmonization. Many of you might immediately say, oh, we have a solution for this, generative adversarial networks are successful, very successful in, in uh, computing this kind of uh, uh, image translation across sites when you don't have matching data. This famous example from Walter Inc. in 2017 showed how we could do that with input in, uh, being MRI and the output being CT. It was noted, however, subsequently that there was problems with geometric distortion, sometimes even hallucination. Although there are solutions that have been proposed, we're looking at a different approach that hopefully won't have some of these difficulties. So we go back to how MR images are created and consider the really two areas where you have to consider to, to acquire or to produce these images. One is the anatomy, where you have parameters that we often think of as T1, T2, proton density, and so forth. You also have parameters in the pulse sequence itself. So we're going to just call these generically contrast parameters. So we have anatomy and contrast. Uh, we know that the pulse sequence uh, uh, parameters are numerous and sometimes unknown to us. But nevertheless, if we knew them and we knew the anatomy, we could in principle find an imaging equation that would tell us how the MR image is created. This motivated our work from long ago, 2015, uh, where we thought, well, if we know the beta values and we specifically think of them as NMR parameters such as T1, T2 proton density, and if, if, if we could estimate them, or if, and if we know the theta values or can estimate them, theta we would have particular values like echo time, repetition time, flip angle, and so on. If we can estimate those, then we can simply change the theta value uh, to something else and synthesize arbitrary images using an imaging equation. Though there was some success with this method, we discovered a lot of difficulties in being able to invert uh, the, these imaging equations to find the underlying anatomy 
and also to find the underlying theta values, which were unknown to us. But the idea was interesting and it got us thinking in later uh, years about using modern deep network technology, in particular the disentangled latent space harmonization process. I'm gonna describe three types of, of work that have happened sequentially. First, starting with this initial work from Blake Dewey that appeared in Mackay last year. The idea comes from representation learning where we have this classic uh, figure which might think of as an autoencoder where you have an image, you encode it into some latent space, decode it back to the image. We're looking for a more meaningful latent space, in particular, one that has contrast anatomy uh, separated. We want it to be data-driven. We don't want to have to specify any particular model and, and, and uh, we don't want a pulse sequence model in particular. If we had such a representation uh, already uh, found and discovered and trained, then we could simply replace the contrast variable like we did in Cyclone and get a different uh, uh, contrast. That's contrast synthesis or image translation as we normally would think of it. Harmonization is a little more subtle. We have the same framework, but we replace the contrast with something not quite as drastic. It changes the contrast from a T1 to another T1, but it might be representative of the kind of parameters that will be set at a different site. So harmonization has some challenges that theta has to represent not only the broad class of pulse sequences, T1, T2, proton density, flare, and so on, but it also has to represent subtle variations within, within each of these classes. In order to be properly disentangled, theta cannot contain information about the anatomy, that's the beta space. And the beta space, the anatomy, can't contain information about the pulse sequence. And we're gonna see that this requires uh, us to be very constrained about what we allow to be in theta and beta and how rich those uh, variables can be. And we'll come back to that in a bit. But first, let's look at a key insight that we were able to exploit. Although we don't have traveling subjects between sites, we do have multiple acquisitions at each site in general. So usually uh, scanners would acquire a T1 weighted and they often will acquire a T2 weighted image as well and maybe others. So we have multi-contrasts at each site. So now if we have three sites, for example, um, we have the ability to have multiple contrasts, meaning there's some ability for supervision between uh, these pairs of images, but across them we don't. We recognize this as having the same anatomy, beta, in a given site, but a large contrast difference. Whereas in the other direction, we have different anatomies and only subtle contrast differences across the rows. This is what we're going to exploit as we go forward. So we think about disentangling this way, that we could, for example, have a T1 weighted image that we put into this generic framework. We could have a T2 weighted image that we put into the framework. And we see that we would expect there to be contrast difference. I would emphasize at this point that the encoder must be the same for these two contrasts. We can't have a separate one for T1 weighted and T2 weighted. Otherwise, we can't really put in an arbitrary image and get disentangling. Same thing for the decoder, uh, I should point out. Now, considering that these are the same subject, uh, we would expect that the anatomy variable after we've disentangled is exactly the same. So let's put this into a bit more mathematical framework where we've got contrasts I1 and I2, and we're gonna separate them into their corresponding contrast and anatomy variables with common uh, parameters, uh, weights in the encoder and common in the decoder. Well, if we think about this, uh, swapping betas, since betas are supposed to be the same, if I have I1 and I use beta two, in the decoder, I should still get a good estimate of I1 and vice versa. So this means I can use a reconstruction loss uh, if I, during training, use this randomization trick. I can also use a similarity loss on the betas because after all, I expect that whether I put in a T1 weighted or a T2 weighted, I'm gonna get the same anatomy variable. Now we come back to the latent space. We had to 
find very restrictive latent spaces. Initially, I'm going to have theta be just a one dimensional variable, which means despite the wide variation in contrast, I want to represent every image on just one axis. The beta variable anatomy is going to be represented by a one hot encoded vector in R5, maybe R4, but in the cases I'll show you R5, which means that it's just a vector that's either one or zero and only one of the uh, values in the, in the vector can be a one. So for example, in this uh, uh, example, after training, I'm giving you theta turned out to be minus 1560 and the beta channels turned out to look like this. They're binary channels. There are five of them and only one of them at any pixel is a one. Now, having looked at this, we realized that the randomization process can be richer we can swap channels, not just entire beta vectors. So that's what we generally will do. Okay, now in this initial framework, I can go ahead and talk about some experiments with three different sites. Um, each site had these pairs and we're gonna be training the networks using all the data from all three sites, uh, randomly selected and thrown in in pairs as we go. So the results are demonstrated here for the ability to distinguish theta. As it turns out, uh, the theta axis here is, turns out to be negative, and most of the T2s are grouped around zero, and the T1s are spaced a little bit, as I'll show in a second. Um, when we put in the testing data, we find out that the sites are also separated, as we can see from this histogram. Below, IXI, KKI, A, and B are in different places. And in fact, if we then go and swap back different thetas, we can see that we can simulate uh, from this single initial input scan, different contrasts as if they came from the different sites. That's the harmonization strategy that we've been looking for. As an aside, we realized that we could throw in a theta value that was never in the training data and use the decoder to see what happens. And it turns out you get some image that, um, might not be a realistic image, could be used for some purposes that we haven't really explored at this point. Now, Leon Rejuo uh, sort of took over the project a bit and said, uh, well, there's some deficiencies in the previous approach and also uh, could use a theoretical framework and then develop calamity, which I'll now describe. Well, what are the issues that he identified? So different sites can still learn, well, not still, but in that previous uh, version can learn different beta representations. Imagine that you put in an image from site A uh, and the encoder immediately recognizes it as site A. It can use a beta distribution that the decoder then understands how to decode. That could happen between the different sites. That will hurt in harmonization where we wanna simply swap a contrast and use the same exact beta representation. We also found that there was cross-contamination between the latent variables, which is something we don't want. In the previous version, we had uh, a 3D accounted for in a very straightforward way. We simply processed axial, sagittal, and coronal uh, separately, and then combined the volumes by median operator, just picking the center value of the three. Uh, and we wanted to do a bit more effective way of, of taking care of 3D data. And finally, we wanted to be able to do domain adaptation if you had two sites that you trained on and then you wanted to incorporate a third site, but you didn't have access to the data from the first two and couldn't retrain, how would you do that? We'll talk about that. And that is a true domain adaptation because we're adapting the harmonization network to a new domain. So to start off with the first uh, uh, change that was made was to separate the encoders. In the previous version, I didn't describe it, the encoder was a unit-based network that had two heads. Uh, and now we're going to be separating that into two. The coder is the same. It's still a unit-based structure that takes two inputs as shown in this diagram below. And we're now using channel-wise random shuffling instead of whole vector random shuffling. Now, um, this diagram below is also shown for site A. It does not mean that the uh, encoders and decoders are specific to site A, it means that the data I'm showing here is coming in this example during training from site A. Now, the opportunity for changing up 
the contrast encoder uh, came and uh, so instead of a, a full up uh, unit, it's a simple uh, neural network having convolutional and fully connected layers. So the second change that was made was to, not a, now that we've separated the encoders, uh, we could actually separate the slices that are input for the decoders. Like before, we want two of them to be exactly the same slice uh, of, of anatomy, but a different contrast. But the other two, should be the same contrast, but a different anatomy, which helps us to disentangle even better. So the X prime is going to be just an image from the volume that has the same contrast, but isn't the same anatomy. The third major change was to introduce a beta discriminator on the anatomy variable. So here's an example where I've shown two sites where we put in uh, data from those two, A and B, we would expect and hope and want to train so that the uh, latent variable, the anatomy latent variable has the same distribution. Uh, so that means that site B will not be trained independent of site A in terms of getting this uh, anatomy. So that's all we're doing is using the beta discriminator to see is are all the sites that we're training looking like the distribution of site A. Now, this does not mean that we can only harmonize to site A because after all, we're just using this to get a common latent space. We still have the ability to harmonize any site to any other site within this framework. So Leon Ray uh, wanted to understand the theory behind this and found that it was solving an information bottleneck theory problem, which is illustrated here in the center, that the idea is that if X prime comes in, now that's a slice that doesn't have the same anatomy as the desired uh, slice that you're trying to reconstruct. You really want to really reduce the amount of information that you're going to keep in the theta variable. In fact, we know that we want the theta variable to only represent contrast. In the decoder side, if you have the anatomy available to you, so the mutual information above shows that it's conditioned upon knowing the anatomy beta tilde, then you really want to use all the information in the theta that's available to restore in the full contrast into the recovered image. So it's a matter of minimizing the mutual information between the input image and that theta and maximizing the information between that theta and the, um, the image that you desire to reconstruct. And in the end, this whole process encourages theta to be small and to encode only contrast. Just a quick overview on the 3D aspect. Um, once we've trained the 2D part of the network, uh, Leon Ray added a fusion network that would uh, more or less optimize our ability to combine uh, images that are processed separately, axial, coronal, and sagittal, when it's producing a full 3D uh, image together. So, in the calamity experiments, we have uh, 10 sites uh, that we studied. Uh, most of these are available uh, publicly. Uh, and you can cast your eyes across the 10 sites and see that they're all T1 weighted, and that's mainly going to be our concentration for this set of experiments. And they have subtle differences, like I pointed out before. Uh, we have 10 subjects per site for training, and there's held out about 400. Among those 400 held out, uh, are some traveling subjects that are uh, exist between site C and D and also another set between E and F. So those traveling subjects held out will allow us to compute uh, quantitative uh, performance results on harmonization. All of the data were pre-processed the same way with N4 correction super resolution on all of the 2D scans, which included many of the T2 and uh, the flare images. Um, Sorry, there's no flare in this example. It's only the T2. Um, we're not having flare yet. Um, and uh, registration to MNI and then white matter peak normalization to scale all the data so that it's suitable for input to the deep, deep networks that we're using. Now, uh, on output, uh, I'm showing that we've also expanded this to a two dimensional contrast space rather than just one dimensional. So it's a little bit larger. That's possible because of the better disentangling that we're doing. Um, and you can see on all of the available testing volumes, each one of these is a representation of the contrast of an entire volume. 
uh, that they're uh, found somewhat in different places, although some of them overlap. If we examine the two that look the most different, we find out that they are in fact uh, different manufacturers, um, different field strengths as well. But the fact of field strength is not necessarily uh, a reason that they're separated. Uh, in this example, uh, two that are almost overlapping, uh, they're both Phillips, but they're different field strengths. So you can dial in um, specific parameters uh, for different scanners and get approximately the same contrast. It's just that manufacturers and people at the site make different choices. Now we wanna do harmonization, not just understanding what are the differences in contrast. So if we take a set of these, uh, uh, these images from the different sites and we harmonize them to this particular contrast from site A, as an example, we have an initial contrast here and it gets harmonized to this position, again, by replacing the theta value with the one <clears throat> at the target site, that blue dot. Um, everything comes pretty close to the blue dot. Um, if the blue dot had been more centered in the center of site A, it might have uh, overlapped site A, in fact. So this is the desired goal. It's having the desired uh, result that we want. Now let's take a look at some of these uh, qualitative results. Um, note at that in particular that site J, D, and G move the farthest. Uh, have to move the farthest. So we expect them to look most different after harmonization. Here are all of them displayed from the 10 sites. Um, if you look at the top row, that's sites A through E, and then underneath it's harmonized. Um, in the third row, it's sites F through J, and then underneath harmonized. And you can see if you cast your eyes on rows two and four, that they look fairly similar. If you look at rows one and three, that's when you see the differences it might be easier to focus on these three sites that I identified from before and look up and down between the, the three of them and realize that yes, uh, they are subtly different contrast. It helpful, it's helpful to zoom up on these particular regions in site J and see that yes, there is a contrast change between the gray matter and white matter and the gray matter and CSF, for example. Um, and that's the whole purpose. But does it matter? So Leonore also did experiments with, um, with downstream processing, in particular with segmentation. I'm not going to have time to show you all the results. I'm just going to show you uh, a qualitative result here. So we had a traveling subject on site C and D. Um, we, we studied all of them and did statistics on all of them, but my example is just one. And we harmonized that uh, subject from site C to D. Remember, these are all held out, so there's the, the, the data is, is using a trained network from other data. Uh, and then we applied the segmentation algorithm slant uh, and got this result where some of the labels are combined so that you can see it more clearly. Um, did the same uh, algorithm on site D, and initially they look on surface very similar, but if you focus in on some of the regions, that I'm helping with the black squares, you'll see that in fact there are differences. And when you compute volumetrics or cortical thickness or something along these lines, you're going to see differences. When we apply slant to the harmonized image, we see a lot more similarity uh, between the two right-hand results. In other words, harmonization worked. Again, we have quantitative results to show that this is uh, statistically true, uh, but I don't have time to show them. Instead, what I'm gonna demonstrate is how really easy domain adaptation is with this framework. So suppose we have a network trained already on sites A and B and C doesn't have any data from sites A and B, but it wants to still be able to harmonize itself and its data to site A or B. So what we do is we can fine tune the trained network uh, that's already been trained on A and B. We don't need A and B data, but we need the network but only update a few of the last layers of the encoders. Keep the discriminator fixed, that's important, so that the beta value from site C is going to be similar to the beta, not the beta value, but the beta distribution is going to be similar to that of site A. In that case, once again, now with this network, we can harmonize C to A or B 
Uh, this is now an example of domain adaptation that never, this network is specific to site C, and it would not, for example, apply to it uh, without retraining to another site. Leon Ray looked at some of the other competitive algorithms that do unsupervised image to image translation and uh, identified some other features that are often important in different applications and asked the question, which ones satisfy which of these features? And Calamity, uh, which is the algorithm I just described, satisfies all of them. Uh, in particular, I, uh, I'd like to focus on the unified structure, which uh, it might be confusing what it means. Uh, it means that uh, if I train on 10 sites, that the structure that I finally trained on can be used to harmonize between any of the 10 sites and any of the other 10 sites. Whereas many of these algorithms uh, can only uh, learn to harmonize on pairs. Now in some very new work uh, carried out by Blake Dewey, um, uh, very recently uh, in his thesis, which has yet to appear, uh, so I'm, I'm Giving you, giving you some highlight uh, results that are not yet uh, published. Uh, we, he took a look at using Calamity um, to harmonize clinical data. So there's two big changes here. It's clinical quality data rather than research. So it might be a little bit wilder than the research data we are initially training on, but also with four contrasts. The reason for four is because these are often used in analysis, in particular in our pipeline for multiple sclerosis, we use uh, T1, T2, and FLARE. So he wanted to be able to harmonize all four of them. Now, I, we were able to harmonize T2s in the previous data. I didn't show you those results. But now we want to harmonize that in a T2 in addition, also PD and FLARE. Also, this would be applied to seven new sites that we hadn't looked at with clinical quality data. So he did find problems uh, with uh, direct application of the calamity uh, framework. I found that there were inconsistent uh, beta space and the distributions of theta were also inconsistent. Both of those problems led to difficulties in harmonization uh, and inconsistency and also a, a appearance of signal intensity drops out, dropouts, a type of hallucination that's undesirable. Just as an example of the kind of problems that uh, uh, Blake was looking at, uh, here's an example of running training calamity on four contrasts and then taking a look at how these uh, uh, anatomy spaces look. And as you recall, when I apply any one of the images, I should get the same uh, uh, anatomy, the same beta vector at least it should be roughly appearing. It should be the same ideally, but very similar. And if you concentrate on this fourth column, this fourth channel of the data, you'll see dramatic differences in the way that the first two on the top look compared to the second two on the bottom. What this means is that we're going to have difficulty producing the same uh, quality of harmonization given a T2 weighted uh, image, for example, and a T1, which was not the case uh, when we were training um, only from T1 and T2 directly. So the addition of these other uh, contrasts certainly creates a difficulty in this uh, uh, consistency of beta. So just highlighting some of the changes that Blake made, some of the enhancements that he made uh, to improve the situation, the most important, I think, is, is the discriminator now is used not only across the site, but it's also across contrasts. You can see why that would be the case uh, quite clearly from the previous slide that I showed. He also in introduced a different loss in the beta function in, uh, from before and a different distribution loss for uh, theta, which was previously a Gaussian um, assumption. And he also introduced quite a bit of random data augmentation uh, involving both affine and elastic. Uh, deformations of the of the raw data, all applied to the four contrasts, of course, together. So just to illustrate the improvement that he saw on the previous uh, four images, uh, the new uh, latent space, anatomy latent space, looks much more consistent uh, if you look at beta 4 and beta 5, for example, than previously. It also looks quite more complex, but I'll remind you that this is a very highly com uh, uh, compressed representation 
and we do depend upon the decoder and all of the weights in the decoder to understand this representation and produce these synthetic images that are, are harmonized images. So results that uh, Blake found on this wild data are illustrated here. This is um, a representation of held out data from uh, the nine sites that he studied um, on four contrasts. It looks scattered all over the place, but, uh, but it's really organized. The uh, T1 weighted are all here in the, in the circular dots and the T2 flares are the, are the uh, plus signs, PD weighted are the squares and the flares are the cross. So they're, they're isolated um, and that's good news. We also see that they're clustered into, some of them anyway, into regions. And that we also went back and looked and realized, ah, that's different scanners uh, from different sites had different parameters and they produced separation in this two-dimensional theta space. We also had an interesting discovery. Uh, as I told you, this was clinical data. And so we discovered some outliers where uh, the, the circled uh, symbols are um, outliers. They don't, they're not exactly in the same place as the rest of the, uh, the symbols with the same color and shape. So why is that? Well, we decided to examine all of them, but I'll show you an example from just two. This, uh, this X in, uh, in the lower right was supposed to be up where the other X's are. If we take a look at this one example from where those other X's are and look at the two uh, images, we realize that they're very different. Uh, the, uh, the one on the left is from the uh, dashed line uh, uh, circle above, and then the one on the right is from the uh, one on the bottom right. And we went back and looked and realized that the, uh, they had acquired an incorrect acquisition. It wasn't the protocol they were supposed to use. So in fact, this is an interesting outcome of this uh, way of looking at, at data is that we might be able to detect outliers uh, that are incorrect scans from what were, uh, what were prescribed. Um, now, we also did harmonization experiment like uh, in Calamity and showed that in fact, all the data could be harmonized. Um, and when we put circles roughly on where the site A uh, uh, contrasts reside, all of them were harmonized successfully to within uh, the site A uh, uh, locations of these parameters. So just to look at the differences in the acquired data and the harmonized data of that previous experiment, here's all of the uh, sites with some representative images all taken from approximately the same section on these different people. Um, this is the acquired data. And I want you to focus on maybe the columns of TMS D and E uh, on the PD weighted. That's where you see the most striking difference. In fact, that P, those two PD weighted images look very much T2 weighted and not PD weighted. Uh, and in fact, when you harmonize all of these data, uh, they now look much more conventionally like a PD weight, uh, at least from site A, which is where we harmonize to. So just as a kind of a fun experiment, uh, Blake decided to consider this uh, space of theta again and consider taking one image from site A, a T1 weighted image, and synthesizing all of the contrasts that would exist in this full, uh, full uh, array. Even though we never saw some in some of these, these positions, what would it look like? And uh, this is the result. Of, of, of that experiment. Uh, and what you can do if you cast your eyes across it is you can see representative images, for example, that look like T1 weighted images, representative images that look like the T2 weighted, and images that look like flare, the T2 flare, and then images that look much more PD weighted. So it begins to have this possibilities that we, we can think about uh, beyond even just simple harmonization. There is remaining work to be done. Uh, we wanna do more experiments on downstream processing, registration, segmentation, and so on. The lesion harmonization is not as good as we would want it to be. And we think we need to improve upon that. Uh, we wanna work with additional pathologies. We don't really know what might happen in those cases. Um, the realness of the synthetic image is still is a bit lacking uh, and 
although the accuracy is improved, uh, we might want to make realness uh, better. And also a limitation of the entire approach so far is that we've been basically building networks that will take one input and, and harmonize that one input to some other uh, contrast or some other subtle change in contrast. And the most obvious change that we, we might make would be to tap multiple inputs into the encoder uh, rather than just a single input in, into it. I'd like to thank all those in my lab who contributed to this work. I've mentioned uh, three of them already, but there were many others that contributed. And also to our colleagues in neurology who provided us a lot of data and, and, and helped us in many ways on this project. There's grant support as well, uh, different aspects of the project that, that we used as well. Uh, just to fully cite the papers uh, there, just so you can go back and look to find them. Obviously, one of them has not yet appeared, but will soon. And now it's time for questions. 